Now, former Congressman James Traficant goes on the record in his first interview since his release from prison. Now, eight days ago, he walked out of a federal prison after serving a seven-year sentence for bribery and racketeering. Earlier, the former Democratic congressman went on the record about life in prison, whether he's planning a political comeback, and so much more. Nice to see you, sir. I'm glad to be here. Good to see you again. But to tell you the truth, Greta, I'm glad to be anywhere. Besides... <laughs> Besides well, prison, for one. I come from seven years up at Rochester. I want to say hello to Dre Maddox and Freddie McKnight and all those guys up there. A lot of good guys I met. They're sort of like family in a way. It's a different experience. So you made friends in prison? Absolutely. You know, Nelson Mandela made a statement. He said, if you really want to know the truth about a nation, you've got to go through their prisons. And believe me, he's right. And I learned an awful lot about America going through the prisons. Before we get to prison and all about America, I have to ask you the headline question. Ready? Don't say it. I'm going to ask Because I'm it. going to get personal. I'm, I'm going to ask you Get right at now. me. Get at me, Greta. All right. Are you going to run for Congress again? I don't know yet. There's a lot of people that want me to run for Congress. You know, I was the number one target of the American Israeli Public Affairs Committee and the number one target of the Justice Department since 1983, being the only American to ever defeat him pro se in a RICO trial. And I have big enemies, but I have some grudges, and I want to go at them. I want to go at them big time, Greta. So I have to see, first of all, if I'm viable, and, and second of all, if the people would support me. They come in here and they fractured this district. They broke it up, certainly to make it tougher. I think they also felt they gave me a life sentence that I'd never survive in prison. Then they came to me and said if I said I was guilty, I might even get a pardon, and I told them to shove the pardon up their derriere sideways. So here I am, and if I do run, get your best hold, because I will be running downhill with my tails flapping in the wing wide open. What are the odds you're going to win? I mean, not you're going to win, the, what are the odds you're going to run? The, the odds, and I've saved all comment for your show, because number one, I think you have a great show. Number two, I think you're fair, and that's not trying to patronize you. I know you're going to ask some tough questions, and I'm going to embarrass you before it's over. But I would say at this point it's 50-50, and I have a lot of people that are encouraging me to run because there's so many disenfranchised people, so many, especially in this area. And one of the concerns I have is I come home to is we have Delphi here, the salaried workers, that were completely cut out and lost their pension benefits. It's going to be almost a $250 million impact to this general community. And when you look at it nationally, Dayton, Ohio is going to be hit real hard. The state of Ohio is going to get hit with about $1.5 billion in lost money, economic generation, because of this decision. And I feel, and you know my record, if we could take care of people all over the world, damn it, take care of those Delphi salaried workers, and I expect it to be done. I mean, I'm on your show here asking you and asking Mary to look at this plight because we have here uh, 9,500 workers. They're going to lose their, their pension benefits. They're going to have to pay for their hospitalization benefits. It's an immediate out-of-cost pocket of $50 million with a contributing factor of a multiplication of two for the general metropolitan area of a quarter of a billion dollar impact on an economy that lost steel mills years ago and has been left behind. All right. Grudges. Can't have it. Can't have it. I said, you said you had some grudges. Who are your grudges against? Well, number one, and my wife constantly reminds me to tone down. I brought that guy back from Israel, John Demenyuk. It was my Freedom of Information Act, which proved not only that he was innocent, but who Ivan really was. The case was so sensitive, members of Congress would say, Jim, I love you, but please don't involve me. I sent my evidence to the Sixth Circuit Court in Cincinnati. They wouldn't accept it. I finally sent it over to Israel, to the Israeli Supreme Court, and they called me over there and I went with the family. I did a live interview satellite with Brian Gumbel, and I said, when they put this innocent man to death, they're going to lose 15 to 20 billion dollars every year they get from the American taxpayers. And Brian Gumbel says, what are you talking about? They only get three billion dollars. And I said, Brian, that's only the foreign aid bill. Look at all the other trade compacts, economic assistance, military assistance. 
I'm saying this to you right now. Israel gets approximately $15 billion a year from the American taxpayers. That $15 billion is $30,000 for every man, woman, and child. And people in my district are losing their pension benefits. So I was targeted big time. By the Israelis. The Israeli Supreme Court looked at the evidence, could not refute it. And it came from the Justice Department, Greta. And they said, take him home. I brought him home and he was bombarded ever since. Home to Ohio. Now he's in Germany fighting for his life. Now let me say this. Prosecutor Moskowitz of the OSI Office of the United States Justice Department suborned perjury with Otto Horn. The documents clearly state who Ivan the Terrible was, a man named Ivan Marchenko, not Demenyuk. And they had to release him. And now they can't live with it. They couldn't live with Jim Trafficking, having beaten him in 1983. I was a walking symbol of defiance. And now they have this man in Germany. And if someone doesn't look into this, the American people should be ashamed of themselves. When you allow one American to be violated, you threaten the freedoms of every American. And I can't understand this, why no one in Congress is raising their voice. And the reason is very simple. And this may be you don't want to hear. I don't know. And I certainly don't want to hurt you on your show. You have one of the best. You're fair. But I believe that Israel has a powerful stranglehold on the American government. They control both members of the House, the House and the Senate. They have us involved in wars of which we have little or no interest. Our children are coming back in body bags. Our nation is bankrupt over these wars. And if you open your mouth, you get targeted. And if they don't beat you at the poll, they'll put you in prison. All right, two quick things. One is the Israelis released Dominyak back to the United States, right? The Israeli Supreme Court, and I give them credit. Give them credit. I give them credit, big time. All right, the second thing is, is Israel is a democracy and is our ally. Yes, right? they are. Um, so you have no... And they should be our ally. Okay. They are our friends over in that troubled part of the world. So explain to me what you see as, you know, why you target or why you have a grudge against the Israelis. The grudge is not necessarily a grudge. It's an objective assessment that no one will have the courage to speak about. They're controlling much of our foreign policy. They're influencing much of our domestic policy. Wolfowitz is under Secretary of Defense, manipulated President Bush number two back into Iraq. They pushed definitely, definitely to try and get Bush before he left to move into Iran. We're conducting an expansionist policy of Israel and everybody's afraid to say it. They control much of the media, they control much of the commerce of the country, and they control powerfully both bodies of the Congress. They own the Congress. Are you an anti-Semite? No, I'm not. That's exactly what they're going to say. And I expect that. What I am is an American. And you see, I think America comes first. And we have a one-sided foreign policy in the Mideast. And we've alienated Arabs who have no way of fighting. So what they've done, and I predicted this on the House floor, is they would export violence to America. And they have. They have no other way to fight. I think President Obama knows this. I think he sees this. I think he wants to do something. I think his hands are tied. And I think he's dancing between the raindrops trying to figure how I can politically machinate some scenario to mitigate these problems. Greta, I'm saying this. America is in danger if America doesn't take back the government without foreign inference, interference.